little shorter. <laughs> 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 Kneel down and be lucky. Okay. No oh, wait. All right. I want to. Th the most important thing I want to do is I just want to. Um, I want to thank all of our uh, Republican colleagues for coming today. Uh, we all realize that the this debt ceiling is a significant issue. Uh, I'm very um, appreciative of what Kevin McCarthy did. I'm very appreciative that the Freedom Caucus in the House put out a proposal early on uh, that, uh, and they worked with Kevin McCarthy. I'm proud of all the House Republicans that voted for a debt ceiling increase, and I'm proud of all my Republican colleagues that care about this this issue, and we're here to support what Kevin McCarthy is trying to do. I'm disappointed in the White House. They're missing in action. Uh, this should be the biggest issue they're dealing with every day. Uh, they should be uh, having daily meetings with Kevin McCarthy to figure out how we get this done. Uh, Chuck Schumer should be talking to all of us in the Senate because it takes three groups to get this done. Biden has to sign something, the House has to pass something, and the Senate has to pass something. Uh, I'm very proud of what they did in the House because they focused on, one, we're going to get people back to work. Two, we're going to responsibly raise the debt ceiling. Three, we're going to start the structural changes to get our fiscal house in order. We're going to start down the path of figuring out how we get fiscal responsibility. Uh, so I know everybody here is going to work hard to work with the House to get something responsibly done. Now I'll turn it over to Senator Barrasso. Well, uh, Joe Biden is playing Russian roulette with the American economy. It's, it's dangerous. It's reckless. Uh, he's fear-mongering and threatening uh, to default on the debt. And he thinks you can just continue to spend money and borrow money that we don't have. The American people deserve better than what we're getting from the Democrats and from this administration. This reckless spending, this spending binge that the Democrats have been on for the last two years has brought us 40-year high inflation. People are suffering. Our national debt is now $31 trillion. That's why two-thirds of Americans believe that if we raise the debt ceiling, it has to be tied to reforms in spending. That's what happens with American families. If you max out your credit card, you have to have reforms in spending. And that's exactly what the Republicans in the House of Representatives have done. They've come out with a reasonable, responsible proposal, things that people agree with, clawing back unused COVID money, making sure that for welfare, people who are able-bodied adults without children will work for that. It's time for Joe Biden to take his head out of the sand and sit down and negotiate with Kevin McCarthy. Perhaps the president doesn't think there's anything that's out of line, but there's waste and fraud and abuse. We have to get the spending under control. And it's interesting because in the eight times that we've raised the debt ceiling and have tied it to spending reforms, Joe Biden, either as a senator or as vice president, has supported six of those eight. So it is time for Joe Biden to end his debt ceiling madness. Now, now Senator, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Now we're going to hear from Senator Thurman. Okay. We're all going to make sure you get up there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Well, good afternoon. Uh, we are all here today to express our support for uh, the good work done by the House of Representatives and to indicate that um, there isn't going to be a debt limit increase absent the president sitting down and negotiating spending reforms with Speaker McCarthy and his team. Uh, I pointed out uh, since this has all started that in seven of the last ten debt limit debates there have been policy budgetary spending reforms attached uh, to that debt limit increase so this is not without precedent at all and in fact I didn't may, perhaps Rick or John have already said this but back in 2011 here's what then Vice President Biden had to say about lawmakers who didn't want to negotiate on a debt limit increase he said and I quote how can you explain the fact that grown men and women are will unwilling to budge up until now and still some of them are still unwilling to to budge by taking an absolute position my way or no way that's not governing that's no way to govern you can't govern that way end quote that's from then vice president biden well in 2017 senator schumer publicly stated that he was leveraging the debt limit for policy changes ladies and gentlemen we have to do something about the debt it is 31 trillion dollars and counting if you look at just the interest alone in 2010 it was a little under 200 billion dollars that we paid out in interest on the debt in 2022 it was 475 billion dollars that's a 142 percent increase just to finance the debt that we have today 65 percent of the american people including 58 percent of democrats are saying that any increase in the debt limit ought to be accompanied by 
spending changes, spending reforms, and policies that would help drive down the debt. Uh, we are on the, the right side of this debate. The President of the United States, for 90 days now, has been missing in action. He has been AWOL. It's time for him to come back to the table and sit down and negotiate with House Republicans and come up with something that would spare America from dealing with the risk of default, but also do something that would address what is an unsustainable issue for this country, and that is a spiraling, out-of-control national debt. It's time to do it. The President needs to step up to the table and work with Republicans to get the job done. The American people have been suffering under the oppressive yoke of inflation over the last two and a half years. In Utah, this has meant that the average family shells out an additional thousand dollars a month every single month for their basic living necessities. This is all the predictable, foreseeable, and in fact foreseen result of excessive federal spending. Trying to get a handle on that is difficult. Within the next few minutes, the Federal Reserve Bank is going to announce another interest rate increase. This is going to cause a lot of additional difficulties, but it's in an effort to try to rein in inflation. The underlying cause of that inflation is, make no mistake, excessive federal spending. That's why it would be so unwise, so careless, so thoughtless, so reckless to increase the debt ceiling yet again without a meaningful set of constraints in place to make sure that we don't do this anymore, to slow the growth of federal spending and to bring it under control. Look, uh, the House of Representatives passed a debt ceiling increase that would meaningfully reduce federal spending, pulling it down by about $5 trillion over the next 10 years. Well, we need that. And my, my hat goes off to the House Republicans who got behind that. You had House Republicans who have never voted to increase the debt ceiling before, who did here, because it, it was a compromised document meant to bring about needed reform. That now moves over to the Senate. Significantly, it cannot pass the Senate unless at least 41 Republicans are willing to support it. In other words, no spending bill, no debt ceiling increase can be brought about unless you've got at least 41 Republicans who are willing to vote for cloture on it. As a result of that, uh, I, I hope and expect to see at least 41 Republican senators signaling that we will not support cloture on any so-called clean debt ceiling increase. In other words, any debt ceiling increase needs to have significant, substantive, substantial spending reforms in it, or we should have no business supporting it. I'm circulating a letter. We've got 16 Republicans so far who have signed it. We hope to gather more. Uh, one way or another, we're going to get through this, but we cannot get through it as a country unless we stop spending in a way that gives drunken sailors a bad name when we compare ourselves to them. Steve Daines is next. Thanks. I hope you're enjoying some Montana weather today, <laughs> except we call this July in Montana. Uh, I, I'm struck by the fact that as we talk about the debt ceiling, the Democrats don't want to talk at all about debt. It's, it's one of the two words that's being talked about every moment right now across the country, the debt ceiling. There is one party in Washington, D.C. that's standing between the American people and default on the debt, and that is President Biden and the Senate Democrats. There's one thing standing between responsible spending reforms and the American people, and that's President Biden and the Senate Democrats. There is one thing standing between increasing energy production with responsible permitting reforms and the American people, and that is President Biden and the Senate Democrats. We are united as Republicans in governing responsibly. It is time for President Biden, after 90 days of silence on this ticking time bomb, to finally engage. He needs to come to the table with serious reforms, get on board, and negotiate a deal here to avoid this crisis. Not doing so is the height of irresponsibility. Well, thank you, Senator Rick Scott, for your leadership on this issue. Look, no one standing here today, no one standing behind me wants this country to default on its debt. But at the same time, just like any responsible parent, we will not give the White House another credit card and throw more diesel fuel on the inflation inferno that they've created with their reckless spending policies. The American people and even the national media know that the ball is in Joe Biden's court. 
Speaker McCarthy and the House GOP have put together a responsible bill. They placed it on the table that claws back reckless government spending and hopefully will slow inflation while taking care of the debt ceiling for a year. This bill is a good solution. The Republican GOP bill is a good solution. And let me be clear, there are absolutely no cuts in the VA or the veterans benefits in the House Republicans' proposal. If Democrats bothered to read the bill, they would see no cuts to veterans benefits in the text and it would protect Medicare and Social Security. Coming from a family of veterans and a veteran myself, and also as the father of an enlisted soldier, I'll always make sure our veterans and their benefits are protected. Democrats' fear-mongering and scare tactics using our veterans as political pawns is beneath this office and we've been elected to serve. Across the country, hardworking Americans are struggling to buy groceries that are up in rural America by 20% since Joe Biden took office. Gas and groceries are up 30%. High interest rates have made the American dream of voting at home unaffordable. This economic crisis has been created by the Biden administration and is a direct consequence of the radical agenda. Our country has not kept up racking up, piling up debt on the backs of hardworking Americans. We must face this head on. Joe Biden can stay in his basement and continue to pass the buck, strapping our children and grandchildren with crippling debt. Or we can take responsibility to solve it now. Kansans did not send me to Washington to run from issues. They sent me to solve them. I'm proud to stand with the folks behind me today. We look forward to solving this problem. Next up is the senior senator from Texas, John Cornyn. We're here today because we stand with Speaker McCarthy and the House of Representatives in taking a responsible step to deal with this potential debt crisis. You know, Washington, D.C. is a strange place for a lot of reasons, but one is when Republicans agree and Democrats agree, we still can't get an agreement. And the agreement we have is that the debt ceiling needs to be dealt with. But only the House of Representatives has responsibly addressed this while President Biden has recklessly and irresponsibly ignored his, respons his responsibilities. He needs to get off the couch, call up Kevin McCarthy, and work this out. We all realize, and members of the Senate realize, that this has got to be a negotiation between the Speaker and the President of the United States, and we will support whatever the Speaker negotiates. But it's absolutely reckless, particularly when our economy is teetering, to take this unnecessary risk and cause this unnecessary lack of confidence in our economy and in the future of hardworking Americans. Ron Johnson. So as you've heard, uh, we are here to indicate our strong and unified support as Senate Republicans for what the House Republicans have done to be responsible to use the debt ceiling as was intended to be used. Uh, yes, increase it so we don't default on our debt, but attach to it the fiscal controls that, is, that are, quite honestly, all this deficit spending is mortgaging our children's future. So we need to do something. The American people support us in doing that. But being the accountant in the group here, I, I want to talk a, a, a few numbers, not, not many. But, but I, I want to lay out how incredibly reasonable this proposal is and why Senator Schumer should bring this up on the floor of the Senate and pass it, and President Biden ought to sign it. I, I want to give a big shout out to Senator Rick Scott, who tenaciously held weekly dinners between conservatives in the Senate and conservatives in the House, and we, we worked our way through this issue. None of us have ever voted for an increase to death ceiling. We didn't want to do so. But the only way we were willing to do it is we were able to attach the kind of fiscal controls that House Republicans have done. But you have to understand how far the House conservatives moved in the direction to get 217 votes to pass this in the House. In 2019, before the pandemic, the federal government in total spent $4.4 trillion. In 2022, we spent $6.3 trillion. President Biden in next fiscal year wants to spend $6.9 trillion. That's more than a 50% increase over pre-pandemic levels. Now, in our initial discussions, fiscal conservatives, we wanted to go back to some kind of baseline based on fiscal year 2019, pre-pandemic. 
That's not what the House passed. They went back to fiscal year 2022, $6.3 trillion. Do you understand the, the magnitude of that concession? So again, this is the bare minimum that I think the American people expect in terms of fiscal control attached to an increase in debt ceiling. And we are urging Senator Schumer to bring this up, pass in the Senate, and President Biden to sign this into law. Thank you. Uh, next is Senator Cruz. And speaking for Senator Cruz, apparently, so yeah. <laughs> I'm his neighbor to the north, so I'll take it from here. L listen, Pre President Biden knows what he's facing here. This is not like this is new to him. In his decades and decades in the Senate, he faced this over and over again. And 10 times when he was in the Senate, he voted against a debt ceiling increase. Multiple times, he's negotiated a negotiated deal for a debt ceiling issue. When he was vice president of the United States, he was the lead negotiator to negotiate the debt ceiling increase during the 2011 debt ceiling debate. This is not new. This is not anything crazy or abnormal. This is the American people saying we have a debt ceiling. We should actually talk about our debt. We're one of two nations in the world that have a debt ceiling of any type. We're the only nation that has a debt ceiling like this. The reason we have a debt ceiling is so when we get to that point, we'll actually negotiate what do we have to do to not overspend. So to say, well, we'll talk about this issue later, just raise the debt ceiling now, and then we'll talk about spending later, completely violates the essence of what a debt ceiling even is designed to do. It's designed to force conversation right now. So let's have it. But for three months, the president has said, not gonna negotiate, even though he's negotiated multiple times before, I'm not gonna do it actually this time. And even this week, when Jenny Yellen stepped up and said, okay, now it's gonna be the 1st of June, the president's response was, okay, well, we'll talk about it next week. The president should have stepped up immediately and said, right now, let's get everyone together, it's close. Republicans have acted. The House has already voted and said, we put it out there. This is the time for the president to actually come to the table. We're standing here today to say, we need to deal with the fiscal realities and anyone anyone out there that could say, I'm sorry, there is no waste in government of either party. Please step forward. I'd love to meet you. Because anyone who would say there's no way we can cut anything in government and can't even discuss it, no negotiations because everything's perfect in the federal government, really? Let's just sit down page by page and talk about the issues. Let's get serious about this. We have $31 trillion in climbing in total debt. Let's at least talk about this and start to do something to be able to turn our fiscal, fiscal realities around. Dan Sullivan. Well, I think the big message here is Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden have a problem. And their problem was their strategy was premised on Republican disunity. And what you're seeing right here and what you're seeing over on the House is Republican unity on this really important issue. And it's not just Republican unity, it's Republicans' position being on the side of the vast majority of Americans. But here's the other Joe Biden problem. Here's a quote. I know John Thune already read it, but it bears repeating. When Joe Biden was the leader of the negotiations on the debt ceiling and reforms in 2011, he said, quote, how can you explain the fact that grown men and women are unwilling to budge up until now? And still some of them are still unwilling to budge by taking an absolute position, my way or no way. That's not governing. That's no way to govern. You can't govern that way, unquote. That's President Biden. I don't normally say this, but I fully agree with what he said in 2011. <laughs> so Joe Biden, you got a problem. We all know it, you know it. You need to not do my way or the highway. You need to get off the couch and come negotiate. So you've heard a lot here today and it, it's this simple. The thing that struck me most when we went through COVID was somebody like a Rahm Emanuel that says, never let a crisis go to waste. I got here a little over four years ago, and we've been accumulating debt 
took us over 200 years to get the five trillion. That was in 2000. So it's been a long journey. But when you, on purpose, as your business plan, want to double down on it, Ron Johnson mentioned it by the numbers, we were four and a half trillion in terms of what we were spending, borrowing a trillion. You double down on it, you want to replace the real economy with the sugar high of more government that you borrow from your kids and grandkids? Is that a business plan we want for our country? Joe Biden, Chuck Schumer, and the Democrats have had this as a business plan for our country. Worst inflation we've had in 40 years. And when you look at what's going to happen over the next five to 10 years when the Medicare trust fund goes broke, Social Security does as well, this is just the start of it. They did it. They need to be responsible for it. And this only puts a 25% dent in the additional $20 trillion they're going to put us in debt. Get to the table. The House did the responsible thing. You've had a bad business plan. Don't burden future generations with more nonsense. Ted Budd. Thank you, Senator. Look, we're about to hit the debt limit and hit the limit on our national credit card, but it's not the first time that we've ever done that. Uh, President Biden has negotiated before, but I think it's time that we treat our country's finances like a family would or like a small business would. They would balance their budget. They would not run these deficits uh, because it's not sustainable. So I want to commend Speaker McCarthy and the House Republicans for their unity and for passing a reasonable plan that reigns in spending, it reduces waste, and it lowers costs for all Americans. But before we raise the limit on the national credit card, we must enact spending reforms to make sure that we don't end up in this exact same place again. So we're not gonna blindly raise the debt ceiling without fixing the problem. It's just time to end the Washington spending addiction. Senator Vance. Thank you, Senator. So look, House Republicans have done something very simple, but I think very profound. They've advanced a program that pays the country's debts while putting the country on a more sustainable pass, path financially. And what Joe Biden has done is refuse to negotiate from the very beginning. He's basically playing Russian roulette with the country's finances and telling Republicans they need to do exactly what he wants them to do or he's gonna drive the American economy off a cliff. What Kevin McCarthy and House Republicans just did is save the President of the United States from his own failure of leadership. This could have been a very productive process if Joe Biden from the get-go had shown some leadership, which is what you should expect from the President of the United States. Instead, he put it all on House Republicans to come to a negotiated deal, and that's exactly what they did. The last thing I want to say, I echo everybody's comments from, from, from earlier. The last thing I want to say is I've heard a lot of criticisms from Democrats about things they don't like in this package. I guarantee you all 217 Republicans who voted for it didn't like at least one thing in the package, but they came together because paying the country's debts and doing our job as leadership is more important than any single person. Joe Biden should take a cue from congressional Republicans, show some leadership, come to the table. The country needs him to do exactly that. Senator Ricketts. American families know that at the end of the day, you have to live within your means. Since 2019, our spending is up 54 percent, while our population is up 1.8 percent. That's not sustainable. We're here today to say we support Speaker McCarthy, the House Republicans, and the bill they passed to get needed spending reforms and raise the debt limit. Nobody wants us to default on our debt, and we know we have to control our spending. The House Republicans have done their job. The Senate Republicans are supporting them. Now it's time for President Biden to come to the table and start negotiating where we go from here. We have divided government. This is about compromise. This is the democratic process. The President needs to step up. I know he didn't fail Civics 101. He knows how this process is supposed to work. So the president should come to the table and help us negotiate this so we continue to do the responsible thing for the American people. And next, I'd like to turn over to John Hogan. Thanks, Governor. Some of you look a little uh, cold. 
I'm co I come from North Dakota. I don't think it's actually too bad, but just so you know, because I know you're wondering, right now in North Dakota, it's 71, sunny, with a high of 76. <laughs> so, look, you're hearing the same message over and over here, but that's really important, isn't it? Biden administration said the House couldn't pass a bill. They passed a bill. And not only that, but they passed the bill. Yeah, it raises the debt ceiling, but it puts in place the kind of reforms we need to reduce the debt and the deficit. Now, I think if you go out across America and you ask people, well, do we need to pay our bills and raise the debt ceiling? They'll say, yeah, but they'll also say, we've got to get this debt and deficit under control. And the bill that the House passed does exactly that. So the message is very clear. We stand in solidarity with the House. And the President needs to sit down with House leadership, with Speaker McCarthy, and get this thing done. So the question you all need to ask the Biden administration is what are you waiting for? Get it done, Senator Schmidt. Thank you. As the last one to speak, it's worth repeating. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say <laughs> two more. It's not over yet. Uh, that uh, maybe everything's been said, but it's not been said by everybody. So here I stand before you. Uh, but I do think it's important to note that this is this is a united conference in the idea that we have to have meaningful meaningful spending reforms. And the House has sent something over. You hear Chuck Schumer with his fiery rhetoric on the Senate floor. The truth is, he has no plan. And Joe Biden needs to you know put his aviators on, get off the couch, and get to the table. And that's what we're here to. To amplify, and I will point out one other piece of this package I think is really important. It doesn't get as much talk. The RAINS Act was included in this, so we talk about spending reforms, but we also need reforms in the administrative state that foist these burdens on the American people to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars every year with burdensome regulations. If it's such a good idea, if these unelected bureaucrats think it's such a good idea, Congress should have to vote on this stuff. And I think that's a meaningful reform that's included too that I certainly support. Thank you. I'm Cynthia Lemus from Wyoming. Uh, I served in the House. I know how hard it is for the House, especially House Republicans, to come together because we think for ourselves and we tend to act for ourselves. It was too important this time for Republicans to act alone. They chose to act in unity. They chose to act together. And it's because they know that in the history of the world, no nation has lasted very long when their debt exceeded 100% of GDP. Their debt exceeded 100% of the size of their economy. That's where we are. It's time to act. We support the House in its decision to act in unity, and we speak in unity with them. I want to thank my colleagues, Rick Scott and others, who worked with them to support them and urge them and help them get there so we now can speak with one voice on behalf of the American people who are ready to see responsible fiscal policy in Washington, D.C. And I think to wrap it up is Senator Ted Cruz of Texas. Well, thank you. Hoven, let me say, I'm from Texas. This is bloody cold right now. <laughs> and it may be a sign that hell is frozen over. Because what we've seen in Washington is we've seen Republicans come together united. I'm here today to praise the Republican majority in the House of Representatives. They came together, they stood as one, and they passed a serious bill that avoids a default on our debt, and that makes serious steps to reining in the out-of-control spending and the debt that is bankrupting our kids and grandkids. If you're at home and you're sick and tired of the inflation that is making life harder each and every day, you're tired of paying more at the grocery store, you're tired of paying more in rent, you're tired of paying more at the gas pump, it was caused by trillions of dollars of spending from out-of-control Democrats and the House majority has stood up and led and said we've got to rein that back in for the working families who are hurting across this country. 
Senate Republicans are here today standing shoulder to shoulder united with House Republicans. And I have to say the behavior of President Biden to date on this issue has been wildly reckless and irresponsible. Biden's position has been up until two days ago, he would not negotiate, he would not compromise, he wouldn't even sit down and talk. That was obviously unreasonable. And Biden was doing more than that. He was threatening default of the debt. He was playing roulette with the American economy. Let me be clear, there is one man on planet Earth and one man only who can ensure we do not default on our debt. His name is Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. And here's what a responsible president would say. He would stand up and say, America will never, ever, ever default on our debt. Every month, federal tax revenues exceed cost for the interest of the debt. If the president said we won't default on our debt, we wouldn't. But there's a reason Biden is not saying that. He wants to scaremonger. He wants to scare the stock market. He wants to scare the bond markets. He's counting on the corporate media to echo his scaremongering. But I've got very simple advice on who President Joe Biden should listen to. President Joe Biden should listen to Vice President Joe Biden. In 2011, when Republicans in the House stood strong on the debt ceiling, again because Democrats had had majority of the Congress for two years, had passed trillions in irresponsible spending, and Republicans stood strong and said we will not raise the debt ceiling without serious fiscal reform, what happened? Then Vice President Joe Biden came and negotiated a deal, a deal called the Budget Control Act that was designed to cut $2.3 trillion in spending. It was the most significant federal spending reform in modern times. That happened because Barack Obama blinked and Biden, Vice President Biden, sat down with House Republicans and reached a meaningful compromise. President Joe Biden needs to do the same thing. And I'll say, sadly, the reason he hasn't so far, I believe, is because his mental faculties are too diminished right now to do what he did in 2011, to sit down and actually work together on a solution to the problems. And what we're left with is a bunch of young staffers in the White House, radical children, who are perfectly willing to risk a default on the debt because they have no appreciation of the chaos and misery and damage a default would do. We should not default on our debt but the present path we're on is unsustainable, and Joe Biden needs to come to the table. And I will say, it is a major victory for America that the day before yesterday, Biden finally blinked and said, okay, I'll sit down and talk. That's the first step. Now, the second step is let's solve the problem. With that, let's open it up to questions. Uh, McCarthy and Biden sit down are having what McCarthy and Is there a, a, an openness to doing anything short term on the debt limit to let those conversations, like you've done on spending before, we don't have come to. to a conclusion? We don't have to. We can reach a resolution here. I believe the resolution is going to be a compromise. But for there to be a compromise, the radical Democrats have to be willing to compromise. To date, they have not been willing to do so. They created this problem, and they have not demonstrated any willingness to be part of solving it. Look, I can tell you a, a short-term extension, a clean debt ceiling, is not going to pass Congress. That is a solution that the White House has fever dreams of, but it's not going to pass Congress, nor should it, because doing that would be disregarding our constituents at home who are hurting who are facing the consequences of this uncontrolled spending. Can I just add, can I just add, let me reiterate how incredibly reasonable the House proposal is. Now, from my standpoint, what should happen here is Chuck Schumer ought to bring their bill up to the floor, pass it, and President Biden ought to sign it. That's what that conversation ought to be about next week in terms of when he will do that. Again, $4.4 trillion to $6.3 on a path to $6.9 trillion. Pairing it back to, to 6.3 is eminently reasonable, 
And that is really what we want to support right now is the House bill. Let's get that passed. We can do this immediately. We don't have to, we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait for an extended negotiation. But they ought to be sitting, they, Biden should be sitting down negotiating every day, getting this done. There's, this is the most important thing he should be doing right now. And by, just, by being missing the action is wrong. Well, the House passed the bill. He should, he should negotiate the bill. The bill's got to get through the House. But I think all of us are here because we want to, we want to do everything we can to, you know, make sure Senate Republicans, we're all united and we'll also help, help the House. I don't know if anybody else. I mean, we're, he, he's, I mean, look at what he did. I mean, he got 217 House Republicans to agree to something. Yeah, I don't know how many, of the, how many had never voted for a debt ceiling increase before. I mean, a bunch. So it's remarkable what Kevin did. Yes. What level of spending cuts are you willing to accept in order to raise the debt limit? Uh, and um, so let's say you pass a compromise. What's to stop uh, future? Uh, you know, what would stop uh, members of Congress from waiving that requirement? Like that could be done under the PCA. Yeah. Well, first off, I think we ought to be passing the House bill. Okay, that's what that's the only thing we ought to be talking about now. And I think we, we I think it is important to always make sure it's not something that's easily waived in the future and i think that's one thing they tried to do is make sure that's not what happens and again, I, I want to push back on this phrase spending cuts again 2019 4.4 .4 trillion then we spent way in excess of six trillion during the pandemic 2022 6.3 trillion biden wants to spend 6.9 trillion I mean, understand how insane that is in terms of growth and spending so all we're trying to do is limit the growth of spending put us back on some reasonable glide path had we had we gone back to just a baseline in 2019 grew it by inflation population growth which would be a reasonable way to budget right last year we spent 5.1 trillion dollars we spent 6.3 so let's not talk about budget cuts let's not let the democrats get away with that we're trying to rein this in and put us on a more reasonable and sustainable spending glide path He, he, no, that's, he, he can't do that. And he, um, and by the way, I mean, I, I just don't get it. Why don't he just do his job? I mean, we all know how the Constitution works. There's, you know, you, the White House has to negotiate with the House and the Senate. We don't get to pass just what we want. I mean, do his job. Show up. Yes, sir. Why would you? Why would you do that? If you can't do it now. I mean, why? First off, this didn't come up today. They've known this for months. I mean, they they held off and didn't tell us before we passed the omnibus pass. But even since that was January, what has Biden done since then? He sat on his butt and done nothing. I mean, if he wants to get something done, he he could get it done on Monday. We are all here supportive of doing something. Yeah, I, I just want to. <sighs> The 30 day clean debt ceiling increase is a terrible idea. And the reason it's a terrible idea is because as these guys talked about, Joe Biden did absolutely nothing for three months. So three days a week after House Republicans pass a good package and before Joe Biden has even sat down to talk with them, they're already preemptively trying to get a clean debt ceiling increase. That's not negotiation in, in good faith. That's kicking the can further down the road and hoping that the political winds change a little bit. What they need to do is take the time that we have right now, which is about 30 days before the X date, and pay off the country's debts. House Republicans have advanced a package that does exactly that. It's time for Joe Biden to do his job. So I do have to respectfully disagree with one thing that my friends here said. They said Joe Biden has done nothing the last few months. That, that's not actually true. Uh, he went to Ireland. Uh, he hosted an Easter egg roll at the White House. Uh, he's had reporters ask him his favorite flavor of ice cream. So he's been busy not solving the problems facing this country. And he's also engaged in a lot of demagoguery. One of my favorite examples of demagoguery is in response to what the House of Representatives did, showing up and doing their work. One element of this bill is a requirement that if you're on welfare, you have to be working or seeking work. That you can't just sit at home at the couch 
and not seek work. An overwhelming majority of Americans support a work requirement for welfare. What did Joe Biden do? He demagogued it and said that is, quote, wacko to think that you should have to work to get welfare. By the way, once again, you know, you know someone President Joe Biden ought to listen to? That would be Senator Joe Biden, who has previously voted for work requirements for welfare. But now he's handed the Democrat Party over to the crazy socialist wing of the party that doesn't want anyone to work. You want to know a basic divide in America? It's a divide between the men and women with calluses on their hands who show up and work and believe in the dignity of work versus the people trapped in dependency by the big government socialists. Joe Biden needs to do his job. Stop playing around. Stop playing politics. Sit down and negotiate a reasonable solution that actually solves the problem facing this country. What else? Anybody else? There is nothing unreasonable in the House plan. I mean, I don't know. I don't know anything in the House plan that's unreasonable. It's not unreasonable to say that that you know, if you're able-bodied, you go to work. What's unreasonable about that? It's what's unreasonable about raising the debt ceiling and having structural change. There's nothing. There's not one thing in there. And you know, one thing. One thing. When we when we all met with, we've been talking to House members. We said one thing. Let's make sure what you do is something you can explain. They did. You look, first of all, what the Freedom Caucus put out, you could explain all of it. It all made sense to every American. And you look at what Kevin McCarthy passed. It, made, it, it actually, you go talk to normal people, well, that makes sense. So they ought to pass every one of it, every, all of it. Uh, thank you, everyone. Senator, uh, it appears that as this press conference happened, where the Fed, they raised the interest of rates for 4%, the signal that that may be the end for now, pause is coming. And the 16 year high. Well, first off, I, th I think Jay Powell's done a pathetic job. I think I, I don't understand the balance sheet. He sat there and said inflation was going to be transitory. It's not. Uh, poor families are getting hurt because of his uh, his foolishness. We've got banks that have gone under. And, and what was he doing when Silicon Bank went under with all those uh, people working at the Federal Reserve? What was he doing? Right. So uh, the I, I think that what he's he's doing is hurting the economy. He's been hurting the economy and the um, and I mean, guy, you just look. And the, then, why is he? Why look at the, what's happening to our banks now? We have less money in our banks, which means if you're if you're a business guy like I am, it's going to get harder to get a loan. That's all caused by one person, Jay Powell. Thank you, everyone. Thank you much.